Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bhartia, and welcome to TRFL Let's Talk. Today we have with us Tyson Trotman, VP of Engineering at Fauna. Tyson, it's great to have you on the show. It's my pleasure. Pleasure is all mine. And this is the first time, if I'm not wrong, I'm talking to somebody at Fauna. So I would like to learn a bit more about the company itself. How old is the company? What is space you operate in? What are the specific challenges or problems that you're trying to solve for the larger ecosystem? Fauna fundamentally uh, is uh, kind of the ideal operational database for modern application developers. Um, I think, you know, the company's been around for a little while, actually close to 10 years, uh, because it's hard to build a novel database. A lot of <clears throat> interesting kind of technical innovation that goes into that. Um, but, you know, the problem uh, initially that our two co-founders, Matt and Evan, saw uh, when they were building the data platform at Twitter, um, and something that I've also seen over the course of my career is, Application developers spend too much time thinking about their database. You know, as applications mature, it becomes this kind of huge area for investment, um, particularly as you try to tie your database into uh, some of your, uh, you know, DevOps workflows. And so, um, you know, Fauna was built uh, to kind of solve a lot of those challenges that application developers have out of the box. When it comes to, like, uh, these new principles, as teams are, you know, kind of, collaborating or writing the code, what happens to data and databases? Does it also very well fit into the pipeline? Look, the fact is that app, apps can come and go, we will get new versions, but database is something which is like core critical to any organization. That is the, the most important asset. But when we look at these new workflows, these new principles, automation, collaboration, does database very well fit into these processes or it at times become bottlenecks for developers or DevOps teams? Yeah, I mean, certainly I'd say uh, existing database offerings um, often become bottlenecks for uh, these developer workflows. You know, I think to, to me, uh, the linchpin of kind of modern DevOps is continuous delivery. It's the thing that takes uh, software from a, a change to a module in a larger system to then integrating that change with other modules and then deploying that change uh, you know, from a development environment, you know, probably to a staging environment, to production, maybe through a release pipeline. Um, and, you know, there are sets of capabilities that you need out of a database to practice continuous delivery safely and effectively. I think, namely, you need to be able to verify schema changes against your data. You need to be able to verify schema changes against consuming applications. You need to verify the transition from old to new schema um, and you need to be able to do this all in your existing environments, you know, so in, you know, when you do development, uh, as you're deploying and then in production, um, and ideally you need to be able to do this all in a way that fits into your existing tools. You know, every module in the system can introduce its own ideas about, uh, what continuous delivery looks like and introduce new panes of glass for developers to be, um, kind of staring at as they're doing these things. And so fundamentally when we, thought about how Fauna fits into this continuous delivery ecosystem, those were the challenges that we kind of had uh, top of mind. Excellent. And as you're saying, you know, that the company has been around for 10 years, actually, that doesn't make you an old company, because if you look at Kubernetes, it's going to be what, like 10 years now, right? Uh, that's when Google contributed Borg to CNCF. So we talk about new technologies and then they look back, oh, time passes by so fast. So <laughs> you can call yourself new. I mean, it's, the world is changing. My point is that the world is changing fast. Uh, we talk about, you know, of course, we can go all the way to Docker container days or, you know, <laughs> Linux kernel or Kubernetes and now WebAssembly, all those things. What kinds of evolution you have seen in the database space, or you feel that, you know, yes, database has still remained because it's kind of totally different kind of space, or you have seen evolution, you know, especially when we look at Camila Fauna, so that these databases are suitable for modern workloads. Uh, and when we talk about modern workloads, we are not just talking about moving fast, we are also talking about huge amount of uh, data. We can talk about data like data warehouse. There's a totally different, you know, altogether extracting value from data. So we can also pump into LLMS, all those things. So talk about the evolution of database that you have seen. Are you happy with that? Or you were not happy with that? That's for the kind of gap that Fong is trying to fill. Yeah, uh, it's, a great, it's a great question. It's a big question. Um, you know, I'd say there are a few properties that I think are front and center on the minds of modern application developers. Uh, one is they don't want to manage their database, right? So they don't want to have to think about instance sizes, scaling, sharding, patching, all of those types of things. So uh, 
you know, the ideal database from a developer perspective is serverless, something you consume as an API. Um, the second thing is modern applications that often run at the edge, um, you know, care a lot about where data lives. It's a huge deal for performance. There are other considerations as well, you know, certainly compliance, um, uh, DR as well. Um, and so the ideal kind of modern database handles things like replicating data across regions so it can, can survive, you know, even uh, full regional outage um, and also make data very uh, quickly accessible to consuming applications. That's a big thing. Um, and then, you know, the third one I think is, you know, the ideal modern database that, you know, supports sort of very powerful, flexible access patterns Um you know, so developers aren't constrained by things like a legacy uh, DDL, uh, DQL, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, and if you think about kind of the typical database languages we're used to, like SQL, uh, which is obviously a little long in the tooth now, um, you know, SQL speaks in terms of tables, developers speak in terms of objects, so it forces you to, to, to think in terms of this object relational imp impedance mismatch, which is... Uh, which is a big deal, which is hard. So I, I'd say the modern, um, the ideal modern database kind of addresses those three areas. And that's really what Fauna does. Fauna is consumed as an API. You send us HTTPS requests uh, uh, that contain your transaction logic. Everything executes in the context of a transaction. Uh, we leverage what we call our distributed transaction engine to replicate data across regions uh, with strong consistency. And, uh, and then finally, you know, we are what we call a document relational database. So we store data on disk as documents, um, but we support the kind of query patterns and the attributes that people typically associate with a relational database. So for example, the ability to do joins across uh, different types of data, um, strong consistency, um, those types of, of, uh, of things that, you know, again, traditionally have been associated with relational databases. How are developers dealing with those, some of the limitations, restrictions of historical databases to be able to reap benefits that Fauna is offering? Often it's by making significant investment in kind of the layer uh, around or on top of the database to pave over some of those limitations. So for example, um, when it comes to continuous delivery, which we, you know, kind of touched on um, briefly uh, before, um, you have legacy uh, SQL databases, for example, that have, you know, only kind of limited uh, imperative support for changing schema. And then you have, you know, tools that have come along to kind of build on top of that. So, for example, Atlas is an HCL-based tool um, that tries to bring declarative schema uh, to SQL and traditional databases, um, <clears throat> you know, other vendor offerings, you know, Planet Scales invested significantly in, um, in this kind of these developer workflows around a legacy SQL database. You know, the same is true with Neon and what they're doing, uh, you know, with their kind of uh, uh, write on copy um, through their compute storage separation. So there's different kind of innovation happening at different levels on top of the database. Some interesting things refactoring the storage layer of the database um, to try to get to these sets of capabilities that developers want. Um, again, in the example that we chose to fit into these modern DevOps workflows. We also uh, have started, not have started, but we do talk about, you know, everything as code, you know, infrastructure as code. Uh, from the database and data perspective, what kind of approaches companies can have where they can also look at schema as code approaches and uh, how it solves some of those problems. And, uh, and, and, and I also want to, before actually I ask this question, I want to stick to the older question is also that how much pre adoption are you seeing of some of these new practices, new approaches where you, when you talk to your customers and you're like, hey, everybody knows that they are moving towards it. We just have to help them. The horse is already at the lake. We have to just make them drink the water. Or you feel like, hey, you know what? They still don't realize it. They are still Their teams are still struggling with those limitations. So we also need a lot of education. It's more or less a state of databases. Yeah. I mean, I'd say, first of all, we, you know, to your question kind of directly, um, there's no question that like engineering teams and engineering leaders understand the value associated with some of these propositions, right? You know, modern DevOps practices, continuous delivery, et cetera. You know, I think uh, 
you know, Nicole Forsgren and others in their book, Accelerate, I think did a great job making the case for the business value that's attached to uh, some of these practices, which, you know, maybe surprisingly, but, you know, businesses that do these things have greater market share, more profitability, et cetera. Um, so I think that realization is there. I think, um, again, when it comes to kind of DevOps and CD, I think often the realization breaks down you know, when it comes in contact with limitations of existing tools as the problem. And, and databases are, are kind of the prime example of that, right? So um, folks that are fully bought into this mindset to, to, to practicing continuous delivery, you know, do that with all the other software modules in their system, uh, throw it out when it comes to the database and instead bash together a bunch of changes, have, you know, engineers or DBAs running very manual one-off processes uh, to apply those schema changes to the database. But um, yeah, but I'd say, you know, when the capabilities are there in the database, like they are with Fauna with this recent release, uh, there's a lot of hunger uh, to go and consume those things. We see a lot of appetite from our customers, you know, even uh, as some of these features were in beta to go and pick them up and start using them for their production workloads. Let's not talk about the culture because we touched upon briefly. Uh... How much culture, I mean, we have been asking this question and talking about the cultural changes, the whole DevOps, but from database, data engineers, data teams perspective, uh, talk about the cultural changes that are happening that you're seeing. And not, I'm not talking about the cultural changes we like to talk about, but the cultural changes that are, that are actually happening within the teams of your customers. And how is your approach a bit different, unique, or you're like, you know, this is what is needed there. Yeah, I mean, so let me start answering that question by talking just briefly about what we built and kind of our approach, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of tie it back to the, the, the cultural or team question. I mean, first of all, so with Fauna, um, you know, in a recent launch, we introduced a few kind of very exciting uh, uh, features. The first is what we call the Fauna schema language, uh, which was sort of deeply inspired by a GraphQL schema, um, but is really kind of a declarative language for defining your schema in Fauna. And so when I say schema, I don't just mean uh, like field level schema, collection field level schema for the data itself, but you can go as far as um, defining constraints that need to be true in order for a transaction to complete. Um, you can define what we call computed fields um, which are effectively sort of virtual fields where code's executed at access time. Um, so all kinds of powerful features that are there to define your, your uh, data schema as code. Um, we've also integrated FSL with our Fauna shell. So from the command line, from any, in, in any environment, um, you can define endpoints um, similar to kind of Git, Git configuration, a local uh, directory hierarchy. Those endpoints uh, essentially um, map to where you pull your Fauna schema or, where, or the schema uh, where your data lives. Um, so you can pull down your schema and FSL files um, dynamically as part of local development or in your developer workflows. So um, there are a few important aspects to this. I think, you know, one is uh, this gives you a portable way to um, manipulate schema uh, in any environment. Uh, number two, the schema rides along with your code in your repository. And this is important because um, this all fits into your existing tools. You know, you use Git, uh, Git, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, whatever for, for everything. So we're not telling you, you know, go and check some new additional pane of glass to do a deploy request for your database. This all just fits right in natively to your developer workflows. Um, and when you couple that with other features like our backup and copy functionality, like our data import functionality, this gives you the way to validate schema changes against data, against consuming applications. You can validate the transition, all those things that I mentioned earlier, um, those capabilities that you need in order to practice continuous delivery with your data. Um, I guess I didn't tie that, I didn't come around full circle and tie that to kind of the transformation that we see in, you know, what we see from teams that consume this is all of a sudden they can quit thinking about their data as a snowflake, you know, with one-off deployment processes, they're very uh, worried about touching their data because they don't know, oh, you know, when I um, transition this schema, is something funky going to happen? Is, you know, my, is SQL going to hold a lock on some field that's going to cause a production outage, whatever, you know, instead, um, 
you know, they bake these changes directly into their release pipelines. Uh, they build automation, testing those changes, you know, leveraging FSL on the Fauna shell um, and, you know, can be as fearless uh, making changes to their data as they do with other software components of the system, um, which is a, a huge deal. Let's look at some of the kind of new or emerging use cases, though this one is not an emerging case, but Apple also recently announced that from 19, they are going to start pre-order of you know, their Vision Pro. What it means is that uh, when it comes to like uh, VR, AR, we are talking about even more data, which is not only we are consuming, we are creating more data and, you know, uh, EVs and then, of course, generative AI kind of workloads, uh, AI-driven graphics and videos. What I am trying to understand is what kind of new workloads that you are seeing are emerging, which might push teams or, you know, when it comes to data and databases, that we will be creating more databases, we will be creating more data. These are two different things, structure and structure. And how do you look at it? Do you see as a challenge for the team or do you see as a kind of opportunity? Overall, how do you look at this whole explosion of data databases? Yeah, I mean, again, another big question. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so there are a few things here. You know, the first is kind of the proliferation in terms of size of data. Um, you know, Fauna, again, <clears throat> is an operational database, not an analytical database. So um, we do support large volumes of data. Um, but typically, the use cases that we see when customers get into these more analytical um, style queries is they want to they want mechanisms to kind of ETL data out of Fauna into uh, their analytical database of choice um, in ways that are convenient. So there's a lot of buzz right now about things like zero ETL, uh, which really I think of as more as like kind of managed ETL. But that's something you know we do support a few very convenient ways to get data to get your operational data out of Fauna into your analytical database for some of those types of queries. Um, coming back to kind of your question, uh, I guess, you know, just about AI more generally and some of the operational use cases that are out there, you know, we very much see people building um, AI driven apps on top of Fauna. Um, and, and we're excited about two things, you know, number one, how we can use AI in our product, which there's some really cool things happening there. We recently launched a new AI assistant in our docs page. Um, that's great for, uh, you know, asking questions about the database, doing code translation, et cetera. Um, I think that will become even more core to our product as we leverage um, our knowledge of your schema and your data to, to kind of inform those types of queries and what you can do. Um, but the second important one is kind of how we fit, how Fauna fits into the broader uh, AI application landscape. Um, you know, today, the typical pattern that you see is kind of databases rushing to support um, vectors, um, you know, uh, similarity search uh, so that they can generate embeddings and uh, retrieve content to inject into LLMs, which is, which is cool. We have customers doing this with Fauna in conjunction, conjunction with other uh, databases, uh, really what I'd call more of like indexes like Pinecone and VV8, et cetera. Um, but my own personal view is I think that, uh, you know, um, vector search is just going to be one tool here. I think there are other types of search that will become interesting. I think today it's kind of a hammer. Every, you know, we're looking around, everything looks like a nail to some extent, but, you know, graph search, um, you know, other, other types of search I think will become more relevant. And so, you know, the way we think about it is we have uh, uh, customers storing their primary data in Fauna, and then also using some of our integration capabilities to link Fauna to other types of indexes out there, whether that's vector databases, whether it's Algolia, et cetera, to, to perform different types of search over their data. Um, and we're really excited about that, uh, that future and, uh, and kind of Fauna continuing to be at the heart of some of those application uh, patterns. Dyson, thank you so much for taking time out today to talk about Fauna and, of course, the whole evolution of databases data and uh, these new uh, workloads. Thanks for those great insights, but I would love to chat with you folks again. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun.